Hi everybody, it's Rebecca Levis coming to you from San Diego. It's Sparky's tour time. And this week we are um, still in the book of Leviticus. And I'm looking forward to sharing this parasha with you. It is one of my favorite. Of course, I say that every time. Uh, I hope I can get through this. We have two little ones in the house and a dog. So you might hear some crying and barking in the background, but that's okay. We can continue on as is. Uh, I wanted to remind everybody, if you're joining us for the first time, that we use for our Torah study, this book called A Year Through the Torah for Christians. You can order it online on Amazon and jump right in to the Torah cycle at any point with us. Um, you don't have to start at the beginning. We call the class organic, so you can start whenever you want. Also, I am going to be reminding everybody today that we are starting a Hooked on Hebrew class. It's a beginning um, Hebrew class where you learn your letters and some of the basics about the Hebrew culture and their language. And so that starts April 21st. It's going to be six weeks on Tuesdays from 930 to 1130. So I hope you'll join us. We're going to be using the Zoom app. So you can register at um, northcoastcalvary.org and go to women's ministry. Uh, we study, then go to um, their spring Bible study and you'll see Hooked on Hebrew. And you can register there and join us. So I'm looking forward to teaching that. We use in that class this book, which is an etymological dictionary. And after you learn all your 22 letters and some of your vowels, then you can look up all your words in your Bible and just find so, so many um, amazing connections that you wouldn't see otherwise uh, just reading it in English. And that's what makes this so fun. So let's um, get started for today. Uh, we have um, some very fun things to talk about today and um, some things that are also very convicting today for all of us. It's a special time of uh, the season. Um, tomorrow is Resurrection Day for the Messiah and we're going to see the Messiah all through this parasha and I think tomorrow might be very special as you uh, finish this parasha. I hope you watch it um, today. It is Shabbat. So Shabbat Shalom. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started with a prayer. And it's the typical prayer that we say before Torah study. So let's say it together in the blue. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melaka Alam Asher Kiddishanu Be Mitzvotav Betzivanu La Asok Be Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments and commands us to busy ourselves in the words of Torah. So today the parasha that we're going to be looking at is called Shemini. Shemini is the eighth day, and we're studying Leviticus 9.1 through 11.47, and then we're going to bring that um, connection into the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, which is here. And we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 8 and 10. So that's where we're going today. So Leviticus 9 starts like this. On the eighth day, that's where you get the title of this parasha, eighth is Shemini. Um, Moses called Aaron, the high priest, and his two sons, Nadav and Avihu, along with the 70 elders, to the door of the Mishkan. And he instructed them to take specific animals using specific protocols and offer them on the altar. And then Aaron was supposed to tell the people that today all the Israelites were to see the glory of the Lord. Now remember in Exodus 20, when um, God first spoke the Ten Commandments to Moses and he came to the people to share it with them and they drew back and they were afraid of this God on the mountain. Um, but this time we'll see that the people did not draw back, but they actually drew closer 
And because they drew closer, they got to see with their own eyes the glory of the Lord. Now remember that. If you don't have fear and you draw near, you too will see the glory of the Lord. So remember that as we go through this parasha. So let's continue. So I want to talk a little bit about this eighth day. Eight in Hebrew is a very special number. Uh, eight means um, a new beginning. It, in the scripture, it always refers to a seven cycle finish, seven things have finished, and now the eight starts the cycle again. So eight is the number of starting over. An example would be the seven days of the week, and then they'd start the next week, and it would be called the renewed week. So it's ongoing, week after week after week. And that's the way um, Hebrew works, is it's all cyclical. In other words, it's not like linear, like like Greek thinking and Western thinking is, oh, well, that's past, this is present, and this is future. Hebrews is like, it happened once, it's going to happen again, and it's going to keep happening and keep happening because that's how people learn repetition happening over and over. So uh, we'll see that today when we continue through this parasha. You remember in the beginning, there were seven days of creation, and on the eighth day was the day that God placed Adam in his new home. So he finished all of creation, he took Adam from the ground, and he placed him on the eighth day into the garden. So you see, that was Adam's new beginning of his new home in the garden. And Adam was given a command that would be like a seed model that would um, cycle through every other generation. Every generation of man after Adam and Eve would cycle through the same um, procedures and protocols. And the Bible calls them the first commands from God. And here's what they were. First one was to tend or care for the garden. The second was to have dominion over the animals or the creation, and then to be fruitful and to multiply. So remember I said it's like a seed model? So we're going to take that same model and now fast forward up to where we are with Moses, Aaron, and his sons standing at the entrance of the Mishkan and, and getting ready to do their very first service of sacrifice at the door of the Mishkan. And it's going to apply these same principles to the Kohanim, the high priests, because they were to tend or guard or watch over the people. And they were to rule over the flesh. And they were to multiply righteousness on the earth. You see how that works? So it's cyclical, same pattern. And we can apply it to our lives as well, that we're to tend his kingdom here on earth, take care of it, guard it, protect it, rule over it. In other words, rule over the, the, the sinful nature and then to multiply righteousness on the earth. And that's what the Jews call tikkun olam, to bring righteousness and holiness to the earth. So that's where we're going on this. Also, I wanted to tell you that number eight uh, is Shimone. Um, that's the um, um, cardinal number. Ordinal numbers give you an order, like eighth, ninth, tenth. Um, cardinal numbers are just like one, two, three, four, five. So eight is Shimone. And Shimone comes from a verb. So I want you to see the connection between the verb for eight or new beginnings and what this means um, in what it does. So look, Shimone comes from shaman and shaman or shaman means oil or to fatten and nourish. So every time we begin a new cycle, it's for our personal nourishment or growth. And so you see where that would come from. Oil gives us fat, high calories, nourishment. Um, and so that's the connection. 
I also wanted to show you that there's another interesting thing about number eight in the Hebrew alphabet. It's the letter chet. You have to get that throat chet in there. And it's the symbol of life. Sometimes you'll see Jewish people wear around their neck uh, the same symbol. And it looks like um, this letter hey, and it also has a little tiny yod here with it. Kind of looks like a lamb, actually. So I want to show you some fun words that mean to nourish or to help your growth because you'll see this letter chet in the beginning of these same words. So they have something to do with um, life or nourishment. Look at the word grace, chen, wisdom, hochma. Life is chai, here it is. And then Eve, her name in Hebrew is chava, and she is the mother of all life. And so she's the nourisher for mankind. So I love these kind of connections in Hebrew. It's really fun to see how the rabbis connect all these things. So let's get back to our story. Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu were to start their new ministry of offering sacrifices. And so Moses tells Aaron to do something interesting. He says, I want you to offer for yourself a calf as a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Why? Well, the rabbis say that the calf, personally for Aaron, was because of the sin of the golden calf when he allowed the people to build this uh, idol. He was in charge. And so I'm sure that his conscience needed cleansing. And so God knew that. And he said, Aaron, take for yourself a calf as a sin offering and offer it for yourself. And then he says, and then take a ram also as a burnt offering. Now, why the ram? Well, you remember back in um, the book of Genesis when Abraham took Isaac up on the mountain and God told him to offer his son as a sacrifice. And just as he lifted his hand, he looked up instead of looking at his son. And what did he see? A ram. And it was as God was saying, I have a substitute sacrifice. Because you had your eyes on me, I'm sparing your son with this ram. He was caught in the thorn bushes on Mount Sinai. And do you know what Sinai means in Hebrew? Thorns, mountain of thorns. So here on this mountaintop, the sacrifice of a ram caught with thorns on its head would be the sacrifice. You can see the connections into the New Testament of the sacrificial lamb of God with the thorns on his head. And wow, that's amazing. So along with this calf for his sin of the golden calf, God was offering him mercy and grace with this ram. And that's, those are the symbols that God was um, giving to Aaron. God knew he, his conscience needed um, cleansing. And so we look at some cycles that Israel is going to go through, and we're going to see them cycle through a sin cycle over and over and over again. We're going to see it all through uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And it's because of their human nature. It's all of us. We mean well, but we find ourselves many times cycling back into the old patterns and old behaviors. So um, interesting that cycle is a word for the calf, because when you let it up, what is it doing? So it gets named for what it's doing. So a calf's name is egol in Hebrew. It means to circle. Because when you let a little calf out, he runs round and round and round when you let him out of the stall. And so that's how they named a calf. But it also means a path because they're, they're running in circles and they're making a circular path. So isn't it fun to think about that a calf that runs in cycles is what God would tell Aaron to use for his sin of the golden calf, knowing that he would probably too, like all people, cycle through their sin over and over and over. And by the way, in Psalm 23, that word shows up there where it says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. 
that's the same word, egol. He leads me in cycles of righteousness. And those cycles are what we celebrate in his feasts and the new moon feasts and everything that's cyclical. It's beautiful. So God knows that in our fallen state, we would need help because of this cycle that we go through with our sin. Even Rabbi, Rabbi Shaul or Paul in the New Testament knew that given his old nature being still alive, even though he was regened with the Holy Spirit, he knew that he would tend to cycle in those same cycles. Listen to what he said. He says in Romans 7, I do not do the things I want to do. Instead, the very things I hate, I do. Who can rescue me from this bondage of sin? And then he says, thanks be to the Lord Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach. So Rabbi Paul was saying that he too would cycle through that. And thanks be to God who would break that cycle or have give us power over that cycle. So then after Aaron made the sacrifices for himself, Aaron told him that he was to sacrifice for the people. Interesting for them, he started with a goat. Now, remember when they threw their brother Joseph, the 12 tribes, the youngest brother, uh, next to the youngest was Joseph and then Benjamin. But Joseph was thrown in the pit. And what did they use to deceive their father with the coat being dipped in blood? They killed a goat and used the blood of the goat to deceive Jacob, their father. And so the people, too, had sins that they needed forgiving for. And they, too, had a conscience that needed cleansing. And sometimes we don't even realize we need cleansing. And then God does something in our life, and he says, oh, Rebecca, right? right there. See, see where you hurt right there. I need to cleanse that. That happened to me at the age of 60 with my 85 year old father. He and I needed a little area that we needed to clear up and the Lord made it happen uh, kind of supernaturally, but I'll save that story for another time. So God was making sure that before the high priest and his sons could minister to the people, that they too would first have to have their consciences cleared before they could be a proper sacrifice, a proper one to sacrifice. And then they were instructed to take the um, fat, kidneys, and liver, uh, separate them, wash them, and totally burn them. Now, you're thinking, why is that? That's so weird. Fat, kidneys, liver, who cares? Just throw it all out. Well, in Hebrew, these words have other meanings, and they're, they're tied to something in the spiritual. Let me show you. The fat was around all the organs to protect the organs. So fat is a symbol of protection. Then the kidneys in the Hebrew thinking are the organ of yearning or desire. And then the liver is the weightiest organ, and that's where it gets its name. But it's also the word for glory or importance, the weightiness of God. So God wanted those things totally burned up. In other words, it was a picture of our self-will in us. By burning those completely, it's saying, I'm the one who protects you. I'm the one you've been yearning for. I'm the one who should be number one in your life, the number one importance, the weightiest matter. And so there's a beautiful, beautiful picture there of things happening that you don't always see when you just read it in English. So all the sacrifices were to be done. And once this was all finished and they were all sacrificed, then sin would be atoned for. They would have a new life relationship with God, and all of them would then see the glory of God come down. So that's such a beautiful, beautiful picture of the conscience being cleansed from sin so that they could have new life. Um, when I was studying, I looked these two words up, and I noticed something amazing. I want to share it with you, and those of you who have taken my Hebrew class, you'll understand this. The word for sin is chata. Now, it, it's the het, tet, aleph. And each letter in Hebrew also stands for a number. So notice that het, tet, aleph all add up to 18. 
And that is the word for sin or sin separates and causes death of a relationship. So that's why sin is tied to um, death because that word in Hebrew means to remove from the source of life. Wow. Look at that. And it adds up to 18. What is the opposite of that? When our sin is atoned for, we get new life. And look at, look at the letters. Chet, same as this. Eight, here it is. But you take nine plus one is ten. You combine them and you get the yod, which is the symbol of the hand, the working hand of God. And so when you combine what surrounds you, this tet is a symbol in its ancient picture of a basket or something that holds you and surrounds you, something strong that surrounds you and keeps you from life right here. When God comes, steps in, and the hand of God works, you have haya or life. And that word, haya or life, means to live by the virtue of God's thoughts. It means health. It means to be natural or untamed. In other words, we don't need taming when we're right with God because he tames us. So I just love to look at these letters and see this. 18 is the number of life in the Hebrew culture. And whenever they have a special event or a bar mitzvah or something, they give them um, money in combinations, uh, multiples of 18, because that symbolizes abundant life. I think that's beautiful. So let's move on. Where are we here? Okay. So all of these sacrifices, once they were done, they all included a wave offering. Now, when you just read that, you go, what, what's a wave offering anyway? So look what they waved, and let's look a little deeper about the words of what they're waving, and then maybe you'll see the connection. They're to wave the breast and the thigh of the animal that they sacrificed before Adonai. Now let's look at what these words mean and maybe we'll see a connection. The breast is the word chaze, you see it in the blue, and thigh is shok. So chaze for the breast means to see what's invisible. So when you see the word breast, that means a vision or something that you can't see typically. And then the thigh, shok, means to move energetically towards a goal or to strive towards something. So when you wave the breast, you're saying, Lord, I want to worship the invisible. Give me your vision for my life. And then move me to what pleases you. Move me to the goal of my salvation, which is to grow and to know him more. So our trust is to be in the invisible one. And he should be the one that we lift up and wave before others, just like they did the wave offering. Look at Philippians 3.14. I press to the goal. There it is. Shok. Of the high calling. See, it's lifting it up waving it. It's a high calling of God in Yeshua. Now when you read that scripture in Philippians 3.14, it might have a different meaning to you. I wanted to show you this word when we look it up in that dictionary I was telling you about this one. This is right out of it. See the word chaze, it means a vision or to see what's not normally visible. And here it is. It means the breast containing your heart. So when you're waving that, you're saying, here's my heart, Lord. I want to give it to you. That's my sacrifice. That's beautiful to me. And then I was going to show you also the other word. If you look that up, shok. See, it means thigh. It means to strive or to bring to a goal. And here it is, the word thigh. So it's fun to look these words up. You, you see connections and the Holy Spirit just goes, oh. Don't miss this. This is good. And then he shows you the connection to the New Testament. So after all the sacrificing was done, here's what happened. Aaron's two older sons, Nadav and Avihu, put fire 
in their own incense sensors and they ran into the tabernacle with strange fire, the Bible says, Zur Esh. Um, and they offered it before God. Now, strange fire, Zur means strange or profane or common. It also is the word for adultery or some stranger. That means it was they were offering something God never asked them to offer. And sometimes we think God wants us to do certain things and we rush in on our own and, oh, this would be a good idea. Not always. Uh, sometimes the things we think are good ideas are not really good ideas at all. And so they ran in and they did what they thought was religious. And so they didn't want to miss out, right? Perhaps they did it uh, for a variety of reasons and we're, we're going to cover that in a minute. But let me just say for a moment, we sometimes can do the same thing with our religious activity. We can get lots of zeal and good ideas and, oh, let's do this. You know, this would be great. But you have to pause sometimes and just say, wait a minute. God's not asking me to do that. That was my idea. So before you rush into something, uh, may I tell myself as well as you to pray about it, um, bring it to other wise people, um, get confirmation, or sometimes you get a little check and the Lord says, no, maybe, maybe it was a good idea, but the timing was wrong. So um, I think we all need to... Um, be careful that we're not doing what Nadav and Avihu did because something terrible happened. They were immediately burned up by a holy fire and nothing was left but their tunics. And their tunics were holy. Those are the only things left. But what they did in the flesh was all gone and burned. Here's what the rabbis say in the Talmud, that the reason that God did that is because they were drunk. And you weren't allowed to go in and minister in the tabernacle if you'd been drinking. We don't know if that's true or not. Um, some say it was their pride. You know, they got puffed up and they said, oh, well, watch what we can do. And we also have to be careful with that when we're in ministry or when we're teaching or we're leading something that we're not so full of ourselves and uh, get ahead of God. Um, that can happen in leadership. So some uh, rabbis teach that they died to, due to their lack of respect to Moses. Um, there's a back history with these two. Remember, they went up in Exodus on the mountain with the 70 elders when God called them up to give them the Ten Commandments. And they went up halfway, and then Nadav and Avihu stayed with the 70 elders, and it was Moses that went up to the top. So perhaps they were having some, you know, like, well, why did Moses get to go and we had to stay here? So maybe they saw this as an opportunity now to finally be recognized before the people as important. Who knows? We don't know. But it's all speculation. But it's something for us to think about, isn't it? So I think God was teaching them a real important lesson that we're to have a reverence for what God says is holy. And what God says is a command that um, he wants us to do, not our good ideas. Um, so God wanted to give them spiritual gifts. And with these gifts, uh, he hoped that they would respond with obedience to his voice, not their own. So as they go through these cycles of sin over and over, you'd think they'd learn, right? Over and over and over. But we'll see as we go through the Torah that it's the same thing that all of us suffer with, and it's the sinful nature. So practice makes perfect. Today, God wants us to become skilled at using our gifts to gift others, but yes, when God says to do it, not just when we think it's a good idea. And we're to gift others with our forgiveness and generosity and humility, and things like that. So that's important. So when God gives us gifts like teaching, mercy, helps, uh, hospitality, they're to be like tools in our spiritual toolkit. And we're to be good stewards of these gifts. And we're all to remember that there's no title to seek, no plaques with our names on them in the foyer of your church, no monetary contributions listed on giving charts. 
no selfish perks to manipulate us, and no medals of honor to, hung, to hang around our necks. So Nadav and Avi who did it their way. But look what Isaiah 55, 8 says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. And may I just say, in his timing is not always our timing. Um, so we have to wait for timing and truth to walk hand in hand. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. And that's exactly what happened to Aaron's sons as they got ahead of God. So what's the message? We're to listen to his voice. We know his voice best when we know his word. We're to consume it every day. And don't just be familiar with it. Don't nibble on it. Know it. Know him intimately. Remember, it's Yeshua that all these sacrifices are pointing to. And as we read his word and as we study it and we strive to understand it and become intimate with God, then we live in his shadow and we walk in his shadow. Um, it's, the, it's the is but not yet. We, we walk it out but not in complete fullness until we see him face to face. So I love this word for shadow. It's the same word for image. Zelem is to walk in God's shadow uh, or image. Isn't that what a shadow does? When you shadow somebody, you're following them. I love that. So Moses then, after they were struck dead by the holy fire, uh, he summoned the cousins to come and carry him out by their tunics. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so a reminder to all of us, uh, let, let us never surrender our admiration or praise or worship to any man or any woman or any ministry or minister. Our admiration, our praise, our worship, all the gifts bestowed and entrusted to us as the bride of Yeshua, um, all of it belongs to him and it's for his praise and it's him alone that we worship and give honor to because really our life story is his glory story. And as we allow him to move through us and use us, um, our life story becomes his story. History, get it? Then at the end, Aaron raised his hands toward the people and blessed them with the Aaronic priestly blessing. The fingers they held up like this. And it forms the letter Shin has three prongs and it looks like kind of like an S. Here it is right here. And the shin, you see it on mezuzahs, uh, on the doorposts. Uh, the letter shin stands for the, the name Shaddai. God is called El Shaddai or the mighty God. And the root for Shaddai is Shad or breast. Isn't that something? There we see that word again, breast, the place of nourishment the place that's unseen. And so where did that come from? Aaron, that hand signal, let's look at it. In the movie Star Trek, they needed some sort of sign for the phrase live long and prosper. And so Leonard Nimoy, who was Jewish, held up his hand because he knew the priestly blessing that looked like this. And he goes, how about this? And they looked at it and the producer goes, perfect. And so that's where that came from. Live long and prosper. It was really the Lord blessing the people and saying, may you live long and prosper. So I thought it's fun that um, you know where that came from. So what a relief the people felt after that blessing. And um, that blessing is said uh, whenever the priest wants to bless the people at certain holidays, he comes out and he holds his hands out and he says the ironic blessing. It's so beautiful. I know you've heard it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. It's so beautiful. It's even more beautiful in Hebrew. It goes like this. Ye revet. Yevarechecha Adonai Beishmarecha. Ya er Adonai Panavalecha Vihunecha. Ya er Adam. Ya er Adon. Oh, shoot. Oh, well. You, you can hear it on the internet. Um, 
Rabbi uh, Jonathan Kahn says it, and it's fantastic. So go there. He does it much better than me. So what a relief. These people had um, been forgiven. They've been blessed by Aaron, and their sins have been forgiven. And the rabbis also said that um, the whole nation needed forgiveness, especially because of what happened with Joseph, which I said before. This parasha ends within God giving him some uh, instruction about kosher food, and it comes from the word kashar, which means to connect properly, to be bonded, to uh, fit properly, or be skilled. I always like to say, Jesus made me kosher because he made me fit properly into his plans for my life and uh, we bonded. So there you go. So only animals with fully split hoofs, such as cattle, sheep, or goats, are those that chew their cud could be uh, eaten and only fish with scales and fins. And you're like, what, why? Well, let me show you some fun things. Now, for the animal lovers out there, there was a merciful way to slaughter these animals. It's called shahita. And it's where they slit the carotid and immediately they lose consciousness. There's absolutely no suffering and they still use that today in Israel. Um, and it's a law that you have to have this special type of cutting of the carotid. Um, but let's look at bottom feeders and predators, which were all the other animals that were forbidden. Think about it. Things like shellfish that feed on the bottom or eat all of the um, excrement of the other fish. And then the predators, animals that eat dead rotten meat or that are aggressive and kill other animals. Um, these animals that they were to eat were peacemakers. They were gentle. They provided food. They provided milk. They, they were uh, cyclical feeders even. That's what's so amazing about this. Ruminant animals eat food that are difficult to digest and it takes extra effort to get all the food out. And so God gives them three stomachs to re- churn the food and digest it. And it almost reminds me of how we read his word and we go through it cyclically and we digest it over and over and over to get the most out of it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what we do with his word. And also these ruminant animals that have um, uh, several stomachs, um, they said when they're healthy and they're comfortable and they're not afraid, they produce more milk and they're stronger. So, oh my gosh, that's just like us. And they're uh, flight animals, means they run from danger. Isn't that what God instructs us to do? Flee danger, flee temptation, don't fight back, turn the other cheek, digest your food, get it so that you can get your fill, grow strong, wow. I think there's a connection somewhere there if you just look at it close enough. And what about the fish? Fish, did you know, have seven fins to give them direction? And seven is the number of completion. So perhaps some of the connection with fish is that they always swim in the right direction. And they have scales or armor for protection. So once again, I can see some connection between fish having um, the right direction and protection. I can apply that to myself as well. You know what, scientists have learned what God knew all along, that both of these food sources have digestive systems that are designed for maximum absorption of nutrients and prevention of the absorption of toxins and poisons by their scales. In the spiritual realm, it's like filtering out truth from deception by allowing it to be filtered through the wisdom of God's spirit, which dwells in us. So we filter out the toxins of our culture so that we can be spiritually healthy and strong, just like those animals. So let's wrap this up. We are what we eat. So what is feeding your soul today? I hope it's God's word. I hope it's studying Torah, learning uh, to connect these beautiful Hebrew passages with the New Testament and connect it to Yeshua our Messiah, so that we can have healthy,
digestive systems, that we can absorb his truth, and that we can walk under the protection and direction of his Holy Spirit. When all the people had been blessed, this is the last thing that happened. All of the sacrifices, fire came down and it burned up everything that was offered and they all saw it together. They were so consumed with emotion, it said they cried out and fell on their faces. Look at this word to cry out, Renan. The Israelites were crying out because they were relieved and full of joy. Oh my gosh, they finally saw for themselves God's presence with them. I would sing too. Matter of fact, I cried for four days when I realized his presence in my life. And then I was joyful after that. But I, I was so relieved to know that he had relieved my conscience of my past and um, things that I had done that I felt guilty over. So we see this same word, Renan, to cry out in the word Habanagila. You know, you've seen him sing that Habanagila. That comes from Psalm 118, and it was one of the songs of ascent that the Jewish men would sing as they'd go up on the three feasts to go up to Jerusalem. They'd sing, and Psalm 118, and that word Renan comes from Psalm 118, and it's sung in Havana Gila. And I wanted to just show you what that song means. It's, it's amazing. Um, look what is said in Psalm 18, and you'll recognize how that ties in with this parasha. Look for the words. Give thanks to the Lord, for he's good. His grace continues, cycles, forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his grace continues forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. And that word is Yasha, Yeshua, same word. The voice of rejoicing, singing, and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous. Open the gate for me. Remember they all came and stood at the opening of the Mishkan where God's presence would dwell, the gate way. Jesus, Yeshua said, I am the gate into the presence of God. See the connection? It's all here in Psalm 118. Open the gate for me, the gate that the righteous may enter through. The very rock that the builders, Israel, rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And then it ends with, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that in Hebrew is, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is what the Jews are waiting to say when the Messiah comes. And that's exactly what the people were saying. When Jesus, Yeshua, came into Jerusalem on the donkey at this time of year, it was the Passover, and in he came, the burden bearer, carrying the burden bearer, the donkey carrying Yeshua. And the people cried, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. I think that's our song as we're all celebrating the Passover tomorrow. And um, I would like to sing um, a beautiful song uh, quietly. I'm not going to sing it, but I want to end with um, the same type of joy and singing, the crying out that they sing in the song Havana Gila, which says, let us bring forth rejoicing. Havana Ranana, see the word? Let us sing and be joyful and happy. Uru Achim, Belev Sameach. Awake, brothers, with a joyful and a happy heart. So I'm going to stop this for a moment and I want to share another screen with you. And we're going to end with this beautiful song, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai. So just um, listen to it. Um, look at this short video. It's about three minutes, and then we'll end in prayer together. Uh... 